that he sent his only son, he sent Jesus Christ into the world so that the world might have everlasting life, so that the world might know everlasting life. And then in John 17, John tells us that everlasting life is this, that we would know God and that we would know his son, Jesus Christ. As I think about what God's purpose is and the mission of God here on earth, I begin to think of that, that, that God wants the world to come to know him, that God wants the world to come to know Jesus Christ. But what we know is this, that that mission is not complete, that there is much work to be done. And as I think about what God has called First Broad Street to do, is that he's called us to participate in this mission, to help people come to know him and to come to know Jesus Christ. And so multi-site is just one of many ways in which we can continue to live into this mission because we're gonna be able to go into Kingsport, to go to where the people are. Just like Jesus went to Matthew's house where the sinners were and sat down and ate and broke bread with them, we're able to go to where the people are and we're able to make influence for Jesus Christ in their lives. And so it's a great opportunity, it's a great way for us to join God on his mission and to join God in the things that he is already doing in our community and to be able to participate and give him the glory that he desires from us. God's dream for us to expand our ministries here at First Broad Street United Methodist Church actually began seven years ago. Andrew Amade and Will Lauterbach, both associate pastors here at First Broad Street, began to dream. They planted seeds within our congregation, and soon those seeds began to take root. When Harrison Bell came last year, he had a vision and a desire to help us bring this dream to life. Discussions were had and prayers were prayed. A launch team was formed. And in September 13th of this year, we will begin our new campus worship at the Center Campus. We are one church, First Broad Street United Methodist Church, worshiping in multiple locations. Now, if you're not a part of the launch team, you may be asking how you can be involved in supporting this ministry of First Broad Street. The first thing that you can do is pray. Pray for the launch team. Pray for September 13th, the first worship service of the new campus. Pray for Harrison Bell, that his leadership will be able to lead us to reach more people for Jesus Christ here in Kingsport. The second thing that you can do is to support the campus, to encourage others to attend the campus. Maybe you have a friend that you haven't been able to get to come to our church circle campus, but you might find them interested in the center campus downtown. We invite you to encourage people to come and to worship. We are one church, and it is so exciting to see that God is challenging us and encouraging us, helping us dream God's dream for this community by launching a new campus. What an exciting time to be a part of First Broad Street United Methodist Church. You know, it seems in a person's lifetime that there are critical events, important things that that come our way or occur in our lives that shape our very being. We begin to realize that this is the reason for which we were born. We think about, uh, we think about our careers, we think about our education, we think about marriage, we think about the birth of our children, and, and we can look back over our lives and we can see God's hand in it. And so it is with First Broad Street. In 1969, as two churches First Church and Broad Street United Methodist Churches became one in First Broad Street. Today we're looking at, at stretching out in a different kind of direction. I think of this scripture in Acts chapter 13 and verse 36 where it says, After David had served his own generation according to the will of God. I think back when I was in seminary in the world that I was trained to reach, that world no longer exists. And as the world has changed, for me to be an effective minister, I've had to change with it. And I can see, and you know this, 
that the world continues to change. And the way we do church, the way we are the church, has got to change with it. We've got to continue to impact this, this incredible community of Kingsport for Jesus Christ. As we know, our purpose is to make disciples for Jesus Christ, for the transformation of the world, and that certainly begins at home. So I just encourage you, I encourage you to jump on board, to be a part of this, of this new campus, to be a part of what God is doing, this new thing that God is doing among us. Don't miss out on being the church for today and tomorrow at First Broad Street United Methodist Church. Thank you. Friends, this is an exciting time for First Broad Street United Methodist Church. As I look out here, I see God's people, that if we all work together, that if we all have a singular focus and a singular vision, we can truly change the world, and we can truly change this community. And so I'm just so excited about the opportunity that's before us and how God might work through us to make a difference in the lives of the people around us. There's a launch team. They are spread throughout this room, and this is a group of people that have been spending the past three months or so in prayer together, in community together, learning and living life together to be prepared for this. And so starting on September 13th, most of these people will begin exclusively worshiping on Sunday morning at the new campus for at least a year is their commitment to help us get our feet under ourselves and to help make that an effective community where lives are changed and where people can learn to follow Jesus and where people can be helped along their path and their journey as they live their lives. And so I'm going to invite uh, them to come up. If you are a part of the launch team, I invite you to come up and stand right out here in front of us. And as you do that, we're going to sing a song. know for next service bring your bulletins up good job John and Bonnie good job all right so we are going to do a liturgy together and this is all of us participating so when I, whenever it says people I encourage all of you to respond you're not going to be able to respond but that's okay just know that you're supposed to be responding no problem there we're following our leader good job would you join with me there is one body and one spirit One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Would you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, you equipped and sent forth your friends to bring the good news of salvation all the way from Jerusalem into Judea and then into all of the world. Be present as we send forth these friends of ours, these companions in your service that your kingdom may come with power in our community, that your kingdom may come amongst us in great and mighty ways to the glory of your name. O holy God, you raise up laborers for your harvest, sending them out as sowers of your gospel and caretakers of new life. Bless these now your servants and their work to establish the center campus of First Broad Street United Methodist Church. Equip them for service. Enliven them with your joy and help them remember and trust that it is you who will bring in the harvest. Through Jesus Christ, the Savior of our souls. Amen. Here I am.
Now, friends, members of the launch team, I have a question to ask each one of you. Will you who are committing yourselves to the work of the center campus of First Broad Street do all in your power to support the life and mission of this new work? If so, your answer should be, we will. We will. Awesome. And congregation, all of us together, will you who witness this new beginning support and uphold this launch team and the work of the center campus of our church? If so, your answer should be, we will. We will. Join with me in this. O oh God, bless this new work that we undertake. Send us your spirit as we begin our journey as the people of First Broad Street. E Church. Equip us to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Defend us from all evil and give us the grace to live together in peace and common prayer. In your power, may we become a holy community that transforms the world around us. Amen. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go.
joyful. We adore thee. Joyful, 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 joyful. We adore thee. Our scripture this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 35, verse 2. And in Isaiah we read, It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. And from the New Testament we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself. May God add his blessing to the hearing and doing of his word. Amen. Thank you. What an exciting day this is for First Broad Street United Methodist Church. Goodness gracious, I didn't realize how dangerous Louise Ammons can really be. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Uh, I, uh, I needed a bick or something, you know. I mean, it was inspiring. Years ago, when I first began ministry, the Lord gave me a scripture. And, and I, all these years, I have felt as though it, it were a, a word for the church. And it was that scripture there in Isaiah 35. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. And the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. And I always wondered what that was. And there's a lot of... Uh, uh, different uh, interpretation or translations uh, of those who have made that effort to, to say, what was the glory of Lebanon? And, and I've seen uh, several scholars believe it to be the cedars of Lebanon. And I believe that that's a prophetic word for the church today and for First Broad Street United Methodist Church. That that we are the church. You know, that's who we are. Blossom greatly, rejoice with joy and, and singing. We are the church. One Sunday morning, a preacher stood up in his congregation and he, he said, isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? And an elderly lady in the back yelled out, isn't it good to be the house of the Lord? And thus that scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that we are the church, a temple, even our bodies, a temple of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that God is still using spiritual cedars to build his church. You know that? That it is said that when it came time for Solomon to build the temple, that he used those mighty cedars that grew in the hills around Lebanon. He used them in the, in the foundation and in the framework. He used them even in the furnishings. That is the way he built the church. And I believe that God is still using spiritual cedars to build his church. And I've chosen four that I'll point out to you, and you'll see it there in the outline, there in your bulletin. The first seed I want to talk about that I believe that God uses to build his church is called the little cedar. And the little cedar was 
uh, a cedar that was rather crude and unfinished. It, it was not a showy type thing. It wasn't highly polished. It was used to build sheep pens. And I saw a, uh, a missionary film not, not very long ago, and, and, it, and it showed uh, a man driving an old truck uh, in the hills around Lebanon, and uh, he, he cut down a, a something of a grove of these uh, little cedars, and he stacked them into the back of the truck. And the narrator in the film, he said, now note that, and he pointed this out, that the man stacked the cedars high in the back of the truck, but he never tied them down. And as he drove off the mountain where he had collected those cedars, as he drove off the mountain, he was driving at breakneck speed. And the, and the road was full of potholes, and he seemed to be hitting every one of them. He was bouncing down that road, and, and, and as he was bouncing on the road, he was, he was making these sharp turns again, just speeding, just about to fly off the mountain. And the narrator had said, and I note that not one cedar falls off the back of the truck because the little cedar seem to have a natural tendency. They have a natural tendency to cling together. And I believe that God uses those people with that, with that uh, uh, characteristic in their own lives, that they cling to one another. There is a consistency in their lives. There's a, dependent, a, a, a dependency. There is a faithfulness to one another and to God. And they say, what is it that, 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 that causes this uh, consistency in their lives? And I think one is prayer. Uh, you'll note in the scripture there in Mark 1.35 that Jesus believed that prayer was more important than breakfast. He said he got up a great time before dawn and went out and he prayed. And then in Luke 6.12, you'll note that he, he felt like prayer was more important than sleep. He said he stayed up all night and he, and he prayed. And remember what we learned a couple of weeks ago? I know you remember everything I tell you. <laughs> that wasn't funny. Uh, <laughs> if you've got time to worry, what? you got time to pray. Who said that? Uh, Lord, did you hear? It's over in this section. But that's true. Prayer is one characteristic that brings forth this consistency. I think a second thing is that there are people that read the Word. They read the Word. You say, well, I, I'd read the Bible more, but I don't understand it. Well, you, it's like a spiritual nourishment to our, to our lives. That, that we, don't, um, we don't have to understand everything, you know. Uh, you've heard me say that what I ate last Thursday, I don't remember what it was. But look at me, the evidence is here. <laughs> Isn't that right? And the same thing with, when you read the Word, when you read the Word, it's like it, it builds a, uh, it builds, it puts you in a position where God can use you. Where when He speaks to you, He talks Bible talk. He speaks that language, and you begin to understand what He's saying as your spirit is nearest. In Hosea 4 and 6, it says, My people perish for lack of knowledge. In Amos uh, chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, it speaks of a famine in the land, not of food, but of the Word of God, of hearing the Word of God. May that never occur here. That is, as you pray and as you feast on the Word, you find yourself clinging to one another. You find yourself being faithful to one another and to God. I think a third thing, and, and I list it there for you, is to be a witness. That's a third characteristic that that builds that consistency. Uh, Jesus said, if anyone is ashamed of me and my message, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the angels. That, that if you're a Christian here today, you have a story to tell that the world needs to hear. You may not feel like your testimony is very exciting, but there's somebody out there that needs to hear it. I think another thing, a fourth thing, is, is to give. 
is to give. Um, I use that scripture in Matthew 6, where it says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. You know that Jesus spoke that in the Sermon on the Mount, that where your, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. They say in a church there's two kinds of Christians. There's two kinds of folks in the church, pillars and caterpillars. The pillars support the church, and the caterpillars crawl in and out once a week. And, and if you want to be a support of the church, you want to give. You want to give of your talent. You want to give of everything you have. You want to be a, a blessing in the ministry of the Lord. You know, in Mark 12, I believe, in verses 41 through 44, we wonder if Jesus were here in the flesh today, where would he sit? Would he be up here with me, or would he be down here with with, with Harrison and Amanda? Would he be in the back there with Linda and Nathan? Would he be up in the balcony? Where would he sit? I believe he'd sit up here by the plate. It says in Mark 12, verses uh, 41 through 44, that he went to the temple one day with his disciples, and he was standing by the plates, by the offering plates, and he was watching what people put in. And this lady came in and dropped in a couple of pennies, and he said, did you see that? And they said, see what? Did you see what that woman gave? And it was a poor widow. He said, did you see what that, that widow gave? And they said, Lord, she's doing a couple of pennies. There's people throwing in a lot more than, than that. They said, yeah, but they gave out of their abundance. And she gave out of her need. You want to impress him, give, not just money, but give of every part of your life. And then I think a, a, another thing that, that uh, causes this consistency is our worship, is our worship. And I have that there for you. For God is spirit, John 4, so that those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Lord George uh, was an old prime minister in England. And one day he was uh, in London somewhere and there was a couple of American tourists, a couple of ladies saw him. And, and one of them walked up to him and said, are you Lord George, a prime minister? And he said, well, I sure am. She said, well, you're not very big, are you? <laughs> and he was a rather uh, diminutive figure and when she said, you're not very big, are you? It said that he stretched his head just as high as he could get it. And he said, in our country, we measure a man from the neck up. You ever wonder how God measures a church? Is it, is it by the real estate or the size of the Sunday school? I believe it's by the worship and its worshipers. You with me? So consistency. Consistency is a result of that little cedar. Consistency is a result of prayer, reading the Bible, of our witness, of our giving, of our worship. But there was a second cedar that grew in the mountains, and we call it the fire cedar. The fire cedar. Just as a spark, and it will burn indefinitely because it is saturated with oil. And, and we say, what does that mean, you know, what, when we say the fire, the fire? It is said that there was a safari, a man went on a safari in Africa, he and a, a few of his buddies, and they'd never been hunting anywhere. They'd never been in the hills of southwestern Virginia and shot a a 20 gauge. They didn't know anything about hunting. But they wanted to go on a safari, so they go to Africa and they, they hire a guide and they go out in the jungle. And as it got evening, the guide told them, said, Now, as they're putting up their tents and building camp, he said, We're going to take turns keeping watch. And he said, uh, 
All you've got to do during your watch is keep the fire burning in the middle of the camp here. Keep the fire burning. So about 2 a.m., one of these rookies was keeping watch, and, and, the, and the guy had heard a lot of commotion outside of his tent, and he looked out of his tent, and the, the fire was just about out, and there was pairs of eyes all around the camp. And the guy was standing there with rocks, throwing them at each pair of the eyes. And he was throwing them. And the guide said, what are you doing? He said, I'm protecting the camp. He said, man, the way you protect the camp is to keep the fire burning. And that's the way it is in the church. The way you build a church and keep it strong is to keep the fires of Pentecost burning. And how do you do that? You do that again through your worship. Through your worship. Last church we served, uh, we had this, this uh, grandpa bring his little, his little granddaughter to church one Sunday morning because he wanted her to see the children's choir. And she hadn't spent a lot of time in church and she's sitting there and the acolytes started the service. They came in and lit the candles, and then the, the choir began, and things began to happen. And then finally, the, the little choir assembled, and these kids are, are singing their hearts out. And my friend, my friend turned to his granddaughter and said, Don't you want to join that choir? And she said, No, granddaddy. She said, I want to carry the fire. That needs to be our desire and our wish, that we be a people who carry the fire. You with me? Because when the fires are burning, God begins to move. The atmosphere is built. Worship builds an atmosphere in a church. I always say you can't grow oranges in Minnesota because the atmosphere is not right. It's that way in church, that when the worship is right and our hearts are focused, whether in a building or wherever we are, when our hearts are focused, we are the church, and God can move. And you know that when our focus is off, we start having financial problems. Nobody's lives are changed. No homes are turned around. The message doesn't get out because the atmosphere is not right. Are you with me? Don't let me lose you here. Louis Giglio said, Worship is our response to God for who he is and what he has done expressed in and by the things we say and the way we live our lives. And then the third, a third cedar that grew in those mountains is called the humming cedar. The humming cedar. And the humming cedar, as I put there, the greater the storm, the sweeter the song. It is said, that the humming cedar grew on top of the mountains in, in Lebanon. And it is said they, they would grow in groves. And when the winds would blow, if you listen carefully, it, it would be almost as though they were putting off a musical note. As the wind blew through the grove, you'd, you'd almost hear a song. And they say that the greater the storm, the louder the music. The church has always been that way. There's always been humming cedars that when times never looked worse, they never looked better. They shine the brightest in the darkness. In Acts chapter 16, when Paul and Silas were thrown into the uh, a maximum security cell in Philippi there in the a province of Macedonia there in the northern part of Greece. They were thrown into that maximum security cell after they had been beaten, basically for sharing Jesus. Just beaten. They put them in the maximum security cell, put their feet in stocks, just, and there they, they were just slumped over in their, in, in their bruised and blooded way. And at midnight, and at midnight, in the midst of that prison, what do we hear? 
do we hear two guys saying, Oh, Lord, Lord, I'm just trying to raise a little money and buy a new church bus, and look what they've done to me. Oh, is that the way it was? No. The scripture says at midnight there was a song coming out of that prison. It was praise God from whom all blessings flow. They sang the doxology and Louis set them on fire. You know that? <laughs> and as they sang, the, the stocks fell off their feet. They were free as they worshiped. In the midst of the hurting and bruised way, they were praising God. And the whole place, it said freedom. Freedom is contagious. And as they were set free, the whole, the whole prison was set free. And the jailer, probably in some drunken stupor, when he saw that there was freedom, he knew that if they escaped, he would, he would take their sentence. And so he thought, I better kill myself. And Paul said, don't hurt yourself. We're all here. And the scripture says, his response was, what must I do to be saved? What he really was saying, what must I do to, to get what you've got? What must I do to get what you've got? Can you imagine when he went home that morning, the next morning? And I'm sure his wife had seen him come in morning after morning after morning in some drunken stupor, just cussing and throwing the door open and probably their little girl kind of hiding behind mama's robe, looking around, see what condition daddy's in today. But when he walked in, I bet his face radiated with the presence of Jesus. And the little girl looked around Mama and saw her new daddy. Why? Because a couple of guys were worshiping in the midst of the struggle. We're the church. And the humming cedars are part of it. And finally, look again at your outline. Well, let me share that scripture that Paul would write. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven in despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. That's who we are. We are the church. And finally, the tall cedar. The tall cedar is a, as tall as the trunk would grow out of the ground. The secret was the roots would grow in the ground, 80 to 85 feet. That the strength was not so much in how far the, the trunk reached toward the heavens, it was how deep the roots went that built a foundation that could stand anything. And by that I mean maturity. Look at the scripture, Ephesians 4. Paul would write, Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown away are blown about by every wind of new teaching, we will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. And I'm talking about here is maturity, growing deep in the Lord. What do I mean by that? Look at this quote I have for you. Calvin Miller a great writer really of yesteryear, he said, deep is not a place we visit in our church for God. It is what happens to us when we find him. Are you a cedar in the church of Jesus Christ? Are you a small cedar that, that you've got consistency? People can depend on you on the bumpiest of roads, you're there. The sharpest of curves, the greatest of turns, you're there. Are you a little cedar? Are you a fire cedar so filled with the presence of God that just a spark occurs and you find yourself in the mode of worship? Is that who you are? Or are you a, are, are you a humming cedar that in the midst of the struggle, and when the darkness gathers around you, you never shine brighter? And then finally, are you a tall cedar that as, as you grow, you grow in your roots down. You know the best time to plant a tree? I had a wedding uh, several years ago in a nursery in Radford, Virginia. Never forget this. And in that nursery, they had a sign that said, the best time to plant a, seed, uh, plant a tree is 15 years ago.
The second best time is today. And that's what we're doing. We sang about the seed. We're planting a grove today, a new campus for First Broad Street United Methodist Church. Are you a cedar in the church of Jesus Christ? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to serve you through your church and be your church. We thank you for the vision that has been walked out here today and the courage of men and women who, who want to step out. Those that, that show forth with consistency as being a small cedar. Those full of the Holy Spirit and, and on fire, they're carrying the fire. Those that in the midst of the storm, their song is loud and clear. And those that are maturing in you, Father, we pray your richest blessing on them as they go, as they go. And those of us who remain here, those of us who remain in our, in our venues here, Father, we are all looking toward you. We're all looking toward you to be your church, First Broad Street United Methodist Church, the church of Jesus Christ. Wherever we go, we are yours. We are cedars in your church, in your temple. And as you built the temple of old, build it afresh and anew in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.